election board and it, it to him and it is it is scary because it is questioning whether or not new rules are going to be put in place in Georgia that make it harder to certify the election what is going on so a couple of weeks ago, there was this weird moment at a rally in Georgia where Trump from the stage shouted out by name members, new members of the Georgia State Election Board. And the Georgia State Election Board is not supposed to be like a partisan entity. It's not like a Trump campaign thing. It's the technocratic board that oversees the administration of elections in Georgia. And so him shouting them out by name and claiming them as like MAGA superheroes who were pit bulls for victory was a bad sign. But it turns out that, in fact, three pro-Trump members have been assigned to this board. They are the majority of the board. And since they've taken over this board, they have been passing all of these new rules in Georgia that are designed, among other things, to let local Republican elections officials refuse to certify the vote, refuse to say what the vote total is uh, in individual counties. Republicans have been trying to refuse certification since 2020 in all of the swing states, in a bunch of states that aren't swing states, in more than two dozen, more than three dozen instances. They've just refused to say, here was the vote total in our most recent election. They're doing this leading up to the 2024 presidential election when it seems very clear that no matter what the results are, they're going to say there's no knowable result. And so this letter today is from the Secretary of State's office, from George, uh, Brad Raffensperger's office in Georgia, telling the Georgia Election Board, you need to stop passing these new rules. We're way too close to the election. Joy, on Friday of this week, they're planning, according to this letter, to pass 11 new rules for the administration of the election. This is Raffensperger's office warning that it's way too close to the election for any of these new rules to go into effect and telling them not to do it. He actually calls what they're trying to do absurd. But there's no reason to think they're going to follow this advice. They are really intent on sort of technocratically scuttling the process of, of tallying the votes. And when you say soon, I mean, he, we're talking about early voting starts, advanced voting starts October 15. So we're yeah. talking about in a matter of weeks, not November. We're talking about October voting. They're still trying to pass rules that will make it difficult to certify. This feels like it's not a it's not a 50 state problem. It is a Georgia problem because of Republican control, maybe a Pennsylvania problem, Republican secretary of state. But all they would need is like one or two states with enough electoral votes to bring it short of 270. Right. Like that's the nightmare scenario that somehow we end up because one state just doesn't certify at all. We go into the Electoral College and no one has 270 or we wind up in court cases, Brad Raffensperger suing this election board and taking it to the Supreme Court. Either way, that's two out of three ways Trump loses the election and still could be president. Pot I mean, potentially. It's, it's a very unsettling scenario when you get into those nitty gritty hypotheticals about how this might work. I mean, what would happen, the Electoral Count Reform Act, which was passed after what happened on January 6th, it says that the states have to have certified election results by December yeah. 11th. Doesn't say, though, what happens if they don't. And if part of the reason they don't is because it's tied up in courts and the courts can't be encouraged to meet those deadlines, the prospect arises in which a state like Georgia or some other state that tries this essentially doesn't forward its electoral votes to Washington. What would happen then, theoretically, is that the number of electoral votes you'd need to win the presidency would be reduced. It wouldn't be 270, it would be some smaller number. And theoretically you could get there with us. You, you could get there even if you had not been able to get there had all the state's votes been counted. So, yeah. I mean, it's the, the worry that you have about the courts is the worry that I share, Joy, that this could be something where just delay, just obfuscation, just confusion, just muddying the waters could preclude a state from having a clear result by the time the country needs them to have a clear result. And they feel very confident in their chances once it gets into the courts. And I think yeah. that's ultimately the goal of what they're doing. Yeah, and the thing, the, the bottom line is, and it's something that you talk a lot about on, on the Maddow Show and we talk about a lot about and just in our little circle, is that you have a party that doesn't believe in winning power through elections. They don't mm -hmm. believe fundamentally in democracy. They just believe in having power. And so that means there really there is no limit to what they'd be willing to do to get it. And they really don't care whether that means they won an election or not. That's immaterial to them. Well, yeah, I mean, when Trump won 
the Republican primary in 2016, he said it was rigged. When he won the general election in 2016, he said it was rigged. Before he ran for re-election in 2020, he said it was rigged. When he lost, he said it was rigged. He's already saying 2024 is rigged. He doesn't think that elections are a real thing. He doesn't right. think that elections are legitimate. And he doesn't want an American form of government in which elections decide whether or not he's in power, because he doesn't believe election results should be binding. And so that's what it boils down to when you talk, when people say democracy is on the ballot, that's what it is. Yeah. But the nuts and bolts way it plays out is with what is now a whole of Republican Party strategy to say, you know, we're likely not going to have any election results and we're going to have to figure this out some other way, either with the Republicans in Congress or the Republican leaning courts. We're going to have them sort this out rather than the American people. That's that's yeah. the nuts and bolts way this thing gets worked out. Uh, this is why we say scaring is caring on this show. Since the apparent second assassination attempt against him, both campaigns have been facing questions about heated political rhetoric and which candidate and their supporters have contributed most to our tense political climate. While Trump has blamed Biden and Harris over the assassination attempt and criticized Democrats for calling Trump a threat to democracy, Democrats have defended their claims and pointed to Trump's frequent attacks on Biden and Harris. He's repeatedly claimed if Harris is elected, the country will cease to exist. Joining me now is Arizona Democratic Senator Mark Kelly, whose wife, former Congresswoman Gabby Gifford, survived an assassination attempt in 2011 that badly wounded her and 12 other people and killed six. Um, Senator Kelly, what is your perspective on this? Has political rhetoric gotten out of control in the run up to the election? Well, Anderson, let me just start by saying uh, no family, no individual should ever be subject to political violence. Uh, it's happened, you know, too, time, too many times in our country's history. And certainly, uh, you know, my family, what happened to Gabby over a decade ago, there's no place for that. Um, and, you know, we've got to, you know, consider, you know, what our, you know, the language we use and what it means and how it could incite people. Uh, but what Donald Trump is doing is what he always does, right? He uh, points the finger and he places blame in, in, other, in other places. I mean, literally tonight, we just played a clip of him uh, at a rally in, uh, in Long Island, you know, and saying, you know, don't, don't call your opponent, say your opponent is, you know, going to end democracy. And then he immediately said, she's going to, uh, you know, destroy the country. Well, it's interesting. I mean, it comes from a guy who shortly after I got sworn in to the U.S. Senate assembled a mob in Washington, D.C., and then spoke to that mob and instructed them to go to Capitol Hill because he didn't like how the election turned out. So it's, uh, you know, quite, you know, it's quite odd to hear those words come out of his mouth. But, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen this for over a decade, uh, the way he uses language to divide the American people. And it's really uncalled for, and it's dangerous. So I would, uh, I would hope that going forward here, he uh, rethinks how he's, you know, using this uh, language to divide us. Do, do you think changes need to be made with the Secret Service? I mean, it, it seems like, you know, they're understaffed, certainly, you know, working multiple overtime shifts. It seems stretched thin. Yeah, I mean, I think this is always a, a hard period for the Secret Service when they get close to an election, a presidential election, they, they've got to protect more, more people. I mean, you've got a, another candidate, you've got another vice president, um, former president in this case. I think it's important that the Secret Service take a close look at what they need, come to Congress, ask for the resources. If they need more money, they can ask us for that. I also think it's important that Congress has an investigation. I mean, to have two of these inci incidents here in such a short period of time, uh, and the first one, uh, clearly, there are some issues that have to be addressed. I want to applaud the Secret Service for what happened over the weekend. I mean, in that case, you know, we saw um, what was a really bad outcome did not happen. Yeah. And we're all glad that the former president is safe. Yeah, I mean, the fact that a Secret Service agent, you know, saw a rifle in the bushes and, and you know, through the fence is, is remarkable. You're traveling to two southern swing states this week, North Carolina and Georgia, to campaign for, for Harris. A CNN poll of Arizona shows the former uh, uh, or shows uh, President, former President Trump leading uh, Vice President Harris in Arizona among likely voters, 49 to 44 um, percent. What do you think she needs to, to, to gain ground in your state? Well, elections in Arizona, statewide elections like mine in 2020 
and President Biden and Kamala Harris's in 2020, mine in 2022, they're close elections. I mean, that's, that's the way it is in Arizona. And, um, but on the issues that matter to Arizonans, I mean, the, the choice between the two and the contrast could not be more clear. On the issue that Arizonans really care about because of what Donald Trump did when he was president, which is set up the conditions to take away women's reproductive rights by who he appointed to the Supreme Court. And he even, you know, staked a claim on this. He broke, he said he broke Roe v. Wade. And what that meant for women in Arizona is they've been bouncing back and forth between one bad abortion ban and another. And then also it's, it's the big lie. Look, I think it's very fitting that I, I showed you a clip of, of Maddow there. One of the first mainstream sources, I remember this. Tell me if you remember this because I covered this and uh, back in 2020. Some of you still watched me at that point. My audience was much smaller, but me, some of you were still here. Let, let, the comment, let me know in the comments if you saw this. It was the spring of 2020, early spring or late spring, early summer. And it was Bernie Sanders and Rachel Maddow. And Bernie was the first politician I saw call out the big lie like six months before it happened. Bernie and, 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 and Rachel Maddow played a role in this too because she 100% agreed with him and, 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 and participated. He said, and she said, look, there's going to be a lot of mail-in voting in this election. And we've already seen it. Democrats respect the protocols around social distancing and whatnot, and Republicans largely don't. So Democrats are going to vote disproportionately by mail and Republicans disproportionately in person. And in most of the states, they're going to count the in-person votes first. Because uh, the rules were uh, you couldn't start counting the mail-in votes until election day and had to wait to count them until afterwards. And so Bernie said that night, you're going to see Trump jump to an early lead in some states. But as the count goes on, he's going to get reeled in by Joe Biden and we're confident Biden will win. And we're confident that when that happens, Donald Trump is going to claim victory that night while the vote is only partially counted and then claim it was rigged if and when Biden took the lead, which we, we know he did, uh, and won all the key swing states. And so that's exactly what happened. So she's right here again. Vance and Trump are already planning to lose. And they're not just planning to lose and then lose gracefully. They're planning to lose and then launch another coup attempt, blaming immigrants this time the same way they blamed mail-in voting last time.